Hi, good afternoon. This is Dr. Sanjay Mittal. Uh, as it is very evident uh, that the heart disease is increasing day by day all over the world and majorly in India, so is the heart failure population. And very commonly, we envisage uh, heart failure and the kidney disease to hand in hand go together, which creates a major, major problem for all of us. Today, on this particular topic of cardio renal syndrome, we have two eminent uh, panelists here. One is Dr. Kuller, who is Dinesh Kuller, who is chairman of nephrology and renal transplant medicine in Max Super Specialty Hospital, and Dr. Upendra Kaul who is chairman of Batra Heart Center, New Delhi. And I am Dr. Sanjay Mittal. I am director of clinical cardiology and research at Medanta the Medicity Gurgaon. So uh, the purpose of this particular uh, presentation or uh, uh, interaction is to basically try to deal and understand this cardiorenal syndrome and see how a cardiologist and how a nephrologist work in hand in hand together to treat our patients. To begin with, I'll uh, present a case just to take the ball rolling. A 34 years young man who was an employee of NTPC had a BMI body mass index of 24. He had history of diabetes for three years and presented with dyspnea on exertion for six months. He was in NYHA class three, which is a very common uh, manifestation. Pressure was a little high, uh, about 150 by 90 millimeters of mercury. Heart rate was tachycardic, not tachycardic, 88 beats per minute. He had elevated jugular venous pulse, uh, signs of heart failure in the form of S3 and liver pulsations were there. There was systolic dysfunction on an echocardiogram, ejection fraction was just 20 percent and there was significant mitral regurgitation and very poor uh, uh, strain rate imaging showing just uh, of minus 6.8 of strain. And this was the clinical presentation, which in my opinion would be there in all of our clinical scenarios. Uh, on examination, uh, we found that there was heart failure. And on investigations, the BNP was elevated, 584 picograms per ml. He had uh, HbA1c of 8.6. The sodium levels were 138 milliculins per liter. Potassium was 4.8. Serum creatinine was elevated, 1.86, which gave an EGFR calculated for 46 ml per, uh, per meter square. And uh, the urine albumin creatinine ratio was 58 milligram per uh, gram. So looking at this scenario, uh, my first question, Dr. Call, is how frequent is this kind of a combination in your clinical practice, heart failure and kidney disease, and what kind of problems does it face to you? See, heart failure and kidney failure together, that means the involvement of the kidney in heart failure is fairly common. And in this particular patient, there are a number of reasons. This fellow is a long-standing diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic and uh, very poor ejection fraction. So poor ejection fraction itself, even in a normal kidney, can lead to renal problems because of low perfusion, because of you know venous return problems, congestion. So now here is a situation in which clearly there is a renal dysfunction, EGFR of 46, which is quite low. And if you look at the albumin and creatinine ratio, which is 38, you said, which is grossly abnormal. And uh, this means that he becomes a very, very high risk patient. His mortality, unless we treat him very, very en energetically, which we're going to discuss, is very high. They get, get into problems. And the other problem is the way you treat these patients. You know, before ACE inhibitors and ARBs came, we used to treat them with hydralazine and, uh, you know, isosorbide combination. That was the first drug which improved survival in these patients. But we know that after ACE inhibitors came, nobody looks at them especially, except in you know, black Americans and sometimes in patients with the United you know, renal disease. So we have these very important agents and we have limitations of using these agents because we have to be very careful in using these agents in this class of patients because of the problem of acceleration of creatine increase. And many of the physicians get alarmed with a little increase in creatinine. So one has to see that unless it is, you know, gallopingly increasing, it uh, should not be withheld. Plus, you have to look at the potassium. Now, this gentleman's potassium is already 
brinking towards the upper limit of now 4.8. So one has to be very careful regarding that. So I think that's going to be the key. He would be on beta blocker, should be on beta blocker. Fortunately, his pressures are good. He's more than 140. Mm. So I don't think there should be any problem in starting these agents, except that beta blockers have to be given in smaller doses because he is in fluid overloaded. He has crepitations, he has PND, he has class 3 symptoms. So I think that is the way one has to start. Thank you, Dr. Call. As uh, Dr. Call said that it is a very frequent occurrence, co-occurrence of kidney and heart disease, heart failure, about 30 to 60 percent population having in various trials and also it increases the mortality also by 1.5 to 2 uh, times. So, Dr. Kuller, uh, as a nephrologist, could you educate us uh, what do you understand as uh, chronic kidney disease in heart failure setup and how do you define the uh, cardiorenal syndromes? Also, uh, we would like to understand uh, the clinical problem which Dr. Call said, uh, whether this was an acute kidney injury or a chronic kidney injury which would make hell of a difference in our patient population. Can you educate on all this? Yeah, so it is very important and this is a question which often creeps up, whether a given patient has chronic kidney disease or everything has happened suddenly and it is all AKI. Well, you see. There are fewer ambiguities now in 2019 when it comes to defining chronic kidney disease. There were admittedly quite a few till about a few years ago. And now we base our uh, definitions on chronic kidney disease on two things. One is the GFR. So gone are the days when we will be wanting to address this issue via creatinine. So we are extrapolating the data which we get from serum creatinine and estimate the GFR of a given patient. So on one hand we have GFR and on the other hand we have the albuminuria. So we give due importance to both of them. And then finally it is just not as if the GFR is normal and everything is, is quite okay and patient is fine. No, that may not be the case. To the contrary, we as I said give due importance to both. So it is typically you would say a GFR which is normal that is upwards of 90 that does not mean there could not be a chronic kidney disease. Then we have stages as we are all very familiar with these days. We have a stage 2 that means between 60 and 90. We have stage 3 that is about 30 and 59. Then we have stage 4 that is 15 and 29. And finally we have 15 or less which is stage 5 and that is when we start thinking about dialysis. Now this is chronic kidney disease. But answering your and at the same time we give importance to albuminuria. If the albumin is less than 30 is stage 1 A1 is between 30 and 300 is A2 and more than 300 that is overt proteinuria which is uh, detectable even on the usual dipstick. So, so you will typically say your patient has uh, EGFR, G2 and maybe A2. So, so and then we can finally put them and risk stratify as to where do they stand. Differentiating chronic kidney disease from AKI can actually be a tough task at times especially if the patient comes to you for the first time you may not know as to where this given patient was about a month ago because by definition chronic kidney disease means some damage over a period of 3 months. So on day 1 when you do not have any past history you have to rely basically on your clinical judgment at the end of the day and with all your knowledge and that knowledge means do you have any past uh, creatinine value from which you can estimate GFR, do you have any urine test which shows uh, albuminuria if you had carefully looked for. If you do not have then the fact whether your patient has significant anemia, if there is an ultrasound available which shows some scarring of the kidneys, small kidneys, these are the subtle soft pointers toward uh, presence of chronic kidney disease while if you know it was like a bolt from the blue, patient was absolutely fine, something happened just about 2 days ago, the creatinine has gone up there is uh, everything normal on ultrasound, hemoglobin is perfectly fine, you would tend to believe it could all be AKI. But the real confusion is when there is a combination, acute and chronic kidney disease and I think that is which is most taxing uh, from all of us point of view. So you have to have your basics absolutely right rather than jumping on to the most advanced kind of techniques. Right, so that does create a big, big problem for nephrologists, I mean what to talk about the cardiologist in clinical practice. But as, uh, as we will discuss what, how to handle these patients in our clinical practice. So uh, this gentleman who presented to us, he was taking Ramipril 
and he was taking Carvedil all uh, 6.25 twice a day, obviously uh, underdosed as far as hypertension is concerned, but we must remember this was a hypertensive response due to heart failure or otherwise we have to be very clear. And he was on spinal electron 25 milligrams uh, daily and uh, he was put on diuretics 40 milligrams injectable twice a day to decongest. Now, uh, now the co combination of increased creatinine or low EGFR and albuminuria in this person as we saw and resin angiotensin aldosterone antagonist which he was on is a big, big concern. So, Dr. Call, a renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system in inhibitors, we know they are class 1A indicators. So, please give us some idea why are they class 1A indicators 1. And uh, what are your bottlenecks of them being clinically used in uh, scenarios like this when there is an association of heart failure and AKI, OKC, KD? Well, it is very, very clear from the literature and now this literature is about 15 years old that ACE inhibitors or renin angiotensin system blockers like uh, ACE inhibitors, they started before the ARBs came very clearly captopril had shown benefit and allopril has shown benefit. The SALT study very clearly showed that there was a 20 percent improvement in the survival and that was the first time that in heart failure you are showing such a spectacular improvement although the mortality of heart failure continues to be high. But improving the survival by 20, 25 percent is also a big thing. And then came other you know. ARBs also, they also jumped into the fray, although ARBs first started as agents to reduce albuminuria because ACE inhibitors had already taken that place. But then when you look back, ACE inhibitors also do reduce the albuminuria. So basically actions are almost uh, parallel and then you know the CHARM study showed that candisartan is also useful. So name any ACE inhibitor which has been shown to be useful. So, this is extremely important that every patient with heart failure with low ejection fraction responds quite well to ACE inhibitors unless there is a problem. Number one, starting them in a patient who has got low blood pressure becomes a problem because in the initial their pressure may go down. Now, in this patient we have we do not have that problem. But the other problem is the potassium which is 4.8. One has to be careful in you know titrating these medicines, go with a small dose, see what is happening to the potassium. On the other hand for decongestion you can give you know loop diuretics which to some extent reduce the potassium and that becomes a good synergistic combination. And then once you are on these agents we also know that beta blockers are very useful. Mm -hmm. Beta blockers have shown to reduce the mortality even more than ACE inhibitors. Previously, we used to think of when we were, you know, students that beta blocker is a no no for heart mm -hmm. failure. But today we know they are a yes yes for a heart <laughs> failure. They improve the survival markedly. Once again, you have to be careful. Go slow, but at the same time, go to the doses which have shown improvement in the survival wherever possible. Like in carvedilol, it is 50 milligrams, 25 milligrams twice a day. But one goes slow, like he is on 6 milligrams. Uh, we should increase the dosage. Then comes uh, MRAs, mm -hmm. the mineraloreceptor antagonists and the spironolactone and epirinolone. They again have shown that over and above this, mm -hmm. they improve the survival up to 25 to 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So these three things are so important, but again you have to be very cautious. Once again aldectone or epirinolone, whenever you start, they again increase the potassium your ACE inhibitor is increasing the potassium, the chance of getting hyperkalemia is high. Mm -hmm. So one has to monitor the potassium of these particular patients. Although these days some drugs are coming which reduce the potassium at the same time are good for the heart, but they still are you know investigational and uh, maybe that is the future mm -hmm. uh, of these patients. So that is very, very important. Rehospitalization is another problem. Mm -hmm. You may benefit the patient, symptomatically he is better, but heart failure patients are very prone to come back with mm. symptoms and when they come back to the symptoms their heart failure is even worse, their symptoms are even worse and this is you know very poor for the morale of the patient, the morale of the family. So the agents which reduce hospitalizations also are very, very important mm. and in that uh, 
agents like ivapredine are also useful. This patient has a heart rate of 88. Mm. So any patient with heart failure who has got a heart rate more than 70, ivapredine is also very good mm. because it reduces hospitalizations and the combined endpoint of mortality and hospitalization is reduced. So that is the other agent which should be started and I am sure in the first go he would improve symptomatically and uh, whether his ejection fraction is going to improve that depends upon patient to patient. Some modest improvement has been shown and there are some patients in which the ejection fraction remarkably becomes normal also but then that has to be individualized. One goes with the idea of stabilizing the patients, go to the doses if permissible mm -hmm. which have been used in the trials. Mm -hmm. So they are higher doses, they are not these 5 milligram doses, enalapril up to 20 milligrams. Mm -hmm. And now I think we are going to discuss it further, there are some improvements on acinometer, we have ARNIs, yeah. so yeah. still we have you know plenty of scope although mortality still continues to be high. but we make the patient's lives quite comfortable and improve their survival at least modestly. So Dr. Kuller, uh, this clinical scenario, you know, there are two things. The renin and, and, and angiotensin aldosterone access is basically uh, for acute management of the cardiac decompensation, cardiorenal decompensation. The other thing is the chronic kidney disease. In this person who presents with heart failure, there is obviously a requirement for renin angiotensin access. So in, uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, one is renin angiotensin aldosterone antagonists which you actually uh, look at from the nephrologist perspective, what is your understanding out of it? And the second thing is in acute heart failure setup, when it is a compensatory mechanism which is going on, what do you have? Uh, as an advice for us cardiologists and the and treating physicians to watch for as far as ACN Well, I think uh, before we go on to that, now let us recapitulate our knowledge about this very fascinating word called cardiorenal syndrome. So, so it is something which actually brings us as nephrologists and cardiologists together and something very interesting which when people like Claudio Ronco uh, floated this concept. So if it is uh, moving from the heart side to the kidney, it is type 1 or type 2 of cardiorenal syndrome. If it is from the kidney side to the heart side, it is type 3 or type 4 uh, depending upon whether it is acute that means type 1 or it is chronic that is type 2 uh, calling um, uh, labeled as reno cardiac uh, syndrome. And the type 5 is when there was a common etiology which was driving uh, uh, both uh, the renal dysfunction as well as the cardiac dysfunction. So today when we are looking at predominantly from the heart's point of view, so we are basically limiting ourselves to type 1 or type 2 cardiorenal syndromes. It is very important to, to understand and revise our renal pathology, uh, physiology as far as uh, this is concerned. Now the typical notion earlier on was that since it is a, it's a deep decompensated heart, then probably it is something to do with the cardiac index. So that leads on to uh, a poor flow to the kidneys and kidneys now in turn will try to conserve via renin uh, angiotensin um, uh, aldosterone axis. To our surprise what we found is that in these patients cardiac index may actually be normal or, or, or fairly well preserved. It is actually the CVP which is the culprit. So we tried to fit in so many other things like oxidative stress, like um, uh, inflammation. So, so we still do not know even in 2019 what is actually happening inside but we still are much better off than we were uh, many years ago. So when you look at the same thing from the heart point of view, you are uh, giving or prescribing uh, ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers are predominantly from the heart point of view. While I, if I look at it from a nephrologist point of view, I also have the added uh, responsibility of trying to find ways to lower down the proteinuria and we have enough evidence. So we got excited by the availability of RAS inhibitors, be it ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers when they were first made available and of course as Dr. Call said, um, predominantly with receptor blockers with Losartan, we had the renal trial with the uh, Irbisartan, uh, we had the IDNT trial. So both showed us that there is a significant uh, uh, improvement by giving receptor blockers when it comes to proteinuria. But over the years we have realized since it is a cardiorenal syndrome, so they have a very pivotal role. So, so we cannot take away the, the fact 
that they have been a great class of uh, drugs available to us, but certainly they are not enough. So we need to look beyond them. Another thing, you know, um, for example, we have serum creatinine levels. Most of the trials in heart failure and otherwise, they have been restricting use of uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs for that, uh, and the potassium levels. These are the major, major uh, nemesis for all of us. So, uh, as far as the nephrologist is concerned, opinion is concerned, would you give us a guideline of what creatinine level not to go beyond while using uh, the ARBC ACE inhibitors or uh, would you say otherwise? Yeah, so it is a very pertinent question and we are suffering because we missed out on including patients with more advanced failure in all the trials so far and we just have recently woken up that we need to look into what happens in patients with more advanced renal failure. We are, we are uh, going beyond just uh, stage 1 or stage 2 of chronic kidney disease, even trying to enroll now stage 3 or 4 or onwards. So obviously we are late and we need to wait for a few more years before we uh, uh, get the answer. But till then, we have to go by what information we already have. The most common question asked to a nephrologist, when would you not want to start ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers? which is the cutoff of potassium which scares you. Now, I think after gaining enough knowledge, it is finally your clinical judgment, your common sense which should help you. There is no absolute value which should scare you to start such a promising class of drugs, be it uh, ACE inhibitors, receptor blockers or in the same breath, ARNI. It is basically your uh, impression of your given patient. If you believe that your patient is going to be compliant, your, your suggestion that yes, a creatinine has to be rechecked after initiation grass therapy or potassium has to be rechecked at least for the first uh, a few weeks after initiation of therapy <coughs> in people who are predisposed to hyperkalemia, I think you can be bold enough. Now, typically in this case, you see, we will have to be reminded of the very common scenario. Type 2 diabetes, maybe there is a possibility of type 4 renal tubular acidosis already a, a predisposition towards hyperkalemia. On top of that, you give RAS block it. On top of that, you give uh, MRAs. And maybe someone uh, uh, may have prescribed uh, potassium chloride as well. So everything which is, makes the situation ripe for hyperkalemia. And on top of that, if you forget to guide your uh, patient properly and ask, insist on getting a, a serum creatinine value and potassium values at stipulated periods, um, it could play havoc with your patient's life. But if you are confident and on one hand you are so very uh, optimistic about what good uh, these class of agents can do to your patients, you have no reason to deprive your patients of such wonderful class of drugs. Lovely. Uh, Dr. Call, uh, coming on to the latest advance as you are talking about, you know, uh, the ARNIs, they are uh, now the talk of the town. Um, because I think after so many years, certain new things have come in the field of heart failure. Can you deliberate a little bit of how you rank the ACE inhibitors in and ARNIs in comparison to ACE inhibitors and ARBs? And uh, what is your feeling of uh, their clinical use in day-to-day -day practice, so keeping in mind the yeah. cardinal syndrome? Since we have gone, uh, I would say that we have had a leap in the last four or five years as compared to what we had. We know ACE inhibitors are very useful, we know ARBs are very useful, but we now today know that ARNIs, which is basically a combination of uh, Vilsartan, which is an ARB, and Secubetril, which is a neprilysin inhibitor. Now, neprilysin inhibitor blocks some of those things which get activated during heart failure, and by doing that, they reduce the, you know, the vasoconstriction, they improve the cardiac output, they reduce the vascular resistance, they improve the renal flow and in short they do everything which is additional to ACE inhibitors. Uh, in fact, ACE inhibitor uh, and ARNI, you know, because they can get into problems. You know, you, whenever you have to start a patient on ARNI, you always wait for 48 hours because there can be angioedema. Mm. So if the patient is on uh, ARB, that is angiotensin uh, receptor blocker of the kind of Velsartan or Losartan or anything, you can straight away stop and start ARNI. And uh, once again, one has to be a little careful because of these two actions. Hypotension is a little more of a problem. You start with a small dose, but 
in the trial, the major trial was paradigm heart failure trial, which was for low ejection fraction patients. The dose ultimately was 200 milligrams twice a day. So you start with 50 milligrams, go to 100 milligrams, then go to finally 200 milligrams. In fact, the newer trials now have shown that is Paragon and other things, then you don't have to go through this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, first this and that. You can straight away start the patient on RNA. And even during the hospitalization before the patient is discharged, you can start them on RNA. And the benefit in survival is 20 to 25 percent more than either ACE inhibitor or ARV. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the very uh, remarkable improvements. And they not only improve the survival, mm -hmm. they also, as Dr. Khuller would agree, that reduce the progression of heart, uh, the renal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. They reduce that, <coughs> and especially in diabetics, like mm -hmm. this patient is a diabetic, mm -hmm. their eff efficacy becomes uh, in, in terms of reducing the progression even more because diabetics otherwise are much more prone to progression of heart failure mm -hmm. as well as renal dysfunction. So they have got a very special, uh, you know, utility. They reduce all-cause mortality. They reduce mortality because of cardiac mortality. Mm -hmm. They reduce sudden cardiac deaths. Mm -hmm. Even in patients who are on ICDs, they reduce sudden cardiac deaths. Mm -hmm. So they are very a remarkable molecule and uh, in all probability every patient who has heart failure and uh, needs ACE inhibitors, RNA is going to be much better and uh, that is happening also you know, although their use is still much less as compared to what it should be but then they are coming into it and not to say that beta blockers have to be accompanied with that, it is not only RNA which is going to be, beta blockers have to be there. A spironolactone or epitalinone has to be there wherever it is possible checking the potassium and if the heart rate is fast you will give them ivabradine and if the patient becomes fine and the ejection fraction is 30 they are prone to sudden cardiac death after waiting for some time if the ejection fraction remains less than 35 consider an ICD mm. if the patient has a bundle branch block consider mm. a CRTD mm. so there is a plethora of things we can do to these patients and as you also said earlier that this besides the mortality reduction, even quality of life yes, and uh, uh, the readmission rate was also improved by this thing. So uh, that is the cardiologist perspective. Uh, looking at from the nephrologist perspective, these are also I believe uh, a drug which the nephrologists are very uh, watchful about. So what is your take on uh, the RNA's role in um, the people who have cardiorenal and uh, renal disease per se? So a very promising class of drugs. So we are all as you can see the whole world is quite excited about the availability of RNA and what we are learning about uh, RNA. And I think if we go one step ahead and, and see from a nephrologist uh, perspective as to what may be happening because this is a drug which is predominantly acting at the kidney level. So, so many times we are the ones who would be addressing your concerns, your means cardiologist concerns about the, the, uh, the pertinent usage of uh, this thing. So if I may again try to recapitulate everyone's uh, renal physiology knowledge. If this is the room where we are sitting and call it a glomerulus, we have uh, the blood flowing in from the afferent arteriole on the left hand side and we have uh, the blood going out from the efferent arteriole. So everything is playing around at the level of the afferent and the efferent. Mm -hmm. Now RNA, what we need at the time of heart failure is <coughs> under the effect of uh, natriuretic peptides, more flow should flow in into the glomerulus, uh, the gates should open up and more and more sodium should pass out through the tubules, uh, through the uh, kidneys out so that you have natriuresis. At the same time as Dr. Call had uh, alluded to, if you, nephrolysins are natural sequencers, they take care of both vasodilators as well as vasoconstrictors. So when you give nephrolysin inhibitor, both come back, the vasodilators as well as vasoconstrictors. So obviously you have to combine uh, nephrolysin inhibitor with something which is acting at the efferent arteriole and that is the angiotensin receptor blocker. So that is the concept of the blockage. So on one hand you are opening up the gates, you are increasing the GFR mm -hmm. and you are actually enhancing the chances of proteinuria because this is you are you are worsening the you are increasing the uh, glomerular, uh, glomerular hemodynamics and increasing the uh, pressures here. At the same time you are easing out on the pressure by opening up the efferent arterioles so that the pressure falls a bit. Mm -hmm. But the net event the net effect is something little different from valsartan alone mm. or valsartan in combination with uh, uh, nephrolysin inhibitors. Mm. So that is what drives the whole thing. Mm. So the things typically in a nephrologist's minds are, is it going to have adverse effect on the GFR mm. 
onto the potassium mm. and on the proteinuria mm. because the problem is it is opening up the gates and bringing more water in this room mm. what happens is the glomerular permeability may increase and may actually induce more proteinuria mm. so we are concerned and that's why uh, we were concerned at the time when paradigm uh, heart failure trial was on as to what is going to be the effect on mm. uh, this thing. so talking first about hyperkalemia thankfully the risk of hyperkalemia was not found to be higher in fact as compared to in alapril more than 5.5 was not statistically, uh, statistically different but if you look at higher potassium values they were certainly fewer with uh, arni as compared to alapril so some big relief but proteinuria the caution is still there the proteinuria actually was shown to increase a bit uh, with arni as compared to in alapril mm -hmm. so maybe as as you can see because the gates had opened up but luckily at least during the study period it did not translate into anything adverse as far as the gfr is concerned but we certainly need more reports more uh, uh, observation over many years to finally state that okay it's not bad enough there are few trials like uk harp which had shown us that actually even though not statistically significant but numerically uh, it was uh, uh, lesser of a proteinuria problem with arni as compared to uh, the ACE receptor blocker there so some consolation there but we don't have the final word the finally about the gfr the best thing coming out of arni is as compared to an alapril which also was doing a good to the kidney as well forget about the heart alone arni was one step ahead of uh, uh, an alapril in terms of preservation of uh, gfr and we also have many other things every day you'll come out a new fascinating way by which arni is working be it the usually known things and even some concept of hyperuricemia it takes care of uric acid it also helps so so we are still learning about arni that's wonderful uh, so we have a good thought from the nephrologist perspective also about arni's and rangitids so this person uh, eventually was put on um, 200 mg twice a day of uh, arnis and uh, the metoprolol succinate was escalated as just like you said because as he was taking card matlab not taking card 88 heart rate was enough and anything above 70 should be treated uh, was put on epilenon because of some complaints of gynecomastia and ivibradine was added and this person lo behold improved in 6 months time and he was Uh, initially put on a transplant list but was off to the transplant list because the ejection fraction came up to as high as 50% on these two uh, combinations and as uh, in your opinion just like what you said dr uh, call uh, there has been situation where uh, there are certain reports where uh, uh, results of ejection fraction improvement has been reported and you did point out a little bit and about the five small studies which have been catering there was an improvement in injection fraction about 5% by arni's replacement of ace inhibitors and recently uh, uh, there was a proved uh, heart failure trial which came in september 2nd was released september 2nd where uh, the arni's conversion of ace inhibitors over a period of time one year period improved the ejection fraction by as much as 9.4% so that is there and 70% of the people would improve some kind of ejection fraction improvement will be seen uh, it does not matter whether it is ischemic heart disease or non ischemic heart disease but it does improve so uh, we have a good thought about the arnis in our clinical practice and as as very rightly said uh, we should look at these things in a very uh, good perspective so uh, dr call can you summarize uh, what uh, the role of Uh, arnis would be in your clinical scenario of heart failure as specifically in heart failure with uh, some clinic uh, clinic kidney involvement ckd first of all in all respects arnis are better than ace inhibitors or arbs not only on survival rehospitalizations uh, quality of life so for all practical purposes wherever possible we should be substituting them for ace inhibitors or starting de novo on arnis uh, being careful about all the things like hypotension and other things and also hyperkalemia now in this kind of a patient i think there should be a close cooperation and a mutual consultation with the nephrologist because both information and their knowledge is going to be additive to the benefit of the patient and uh, we need to see that his renal function also 
is not being compromised further, it is stabilized and it improves and which our knees have shown and the cardiac function also improves. So as you rightly said 4 to 5 percent ejection fraction has been shown to be improved and there are some patients, I have got 5 patients in my experience who have normalized their ejection fraction from a very low ejection fraction. One of them had an ICD put in mm. for low ejection fraction and now you know mm, not required. time has come to change the ICD, we are just wondering whether to change it or whether to remove it now. So this is a remarkable group of drugs which should be used uh, very often in these patients of heart failure and all the small tips and precautions should be observed like any other agent. I would not call they are now new agents, they are well established in the therapy, they are class 1 uh, you know in all the guidelines be it European, be it American, be it Indian. Dr. Kuller, uh, can you summarize what uh, guidelines you would give us cardiologists? So I think um, what I would try to encourage the, my cardiology colleagues is that if you want to use, uh, please do not look at an absolute value of serum creatinine or GFR. If you believe your patient can benefit from ARNI, please go ahead. And obviously, you must bear in mind that there is going to be some physiological increase in serum creatinine or reduction in GFR whenever you put your patient on on uh, ACE inhibitors, receptor blockers in the same breath we can say ARNI. So as long as you can guide your patients to monitor their, their GFR and potassium values, I think you can continue with uh, uh, ARNI and, and to, the, to the best possible dose as Dr. Call had rightly pointed out in the, in the proper dose rather than underdosing your patients. Thank you Dr. Kuller, Dr. Call. I think uh, to summarize this is important message. For us uh, cardiologists and nephrologists who are treating patients with heart failure, it is a very common association to have a kidney association with the heart failure and the main uh, crux of the form problem is that when we are dealing with kidney disease with heart failure, we are scared as cardiologists about the creatinine level which the nephrologists are very clear should not be bothered about as far as potassium is concerned and creatinine values are concerned, these have to be watched through the time. And hopefully, if we address this issue properly, we can help our patient population very much. And if I may add, you can, you have now going to have drugs which can be concomitantly given to take care of potassium. The drugs on the anvil like zirconium cyclosilicate, which can be chronically used. So I think potassium may be a lesser of a concern in times to come. Thank you, Dr. Kuller, Dr. Call. Thanks for nice.